Good morning. I'm Bill Hubar, Chief Economist at Trade.com, and welcome to our weekly market analysis show. And we are joined this morning by Stephen Pope, now Professor of Macroeconomics at the University of Maryland. Well, good morning, Doctor. Thank you. So where do we go from here? We're going to look at commodities today. And for you people that are interested, the last commodity we'll talk about is Bitcoin. So stay, stay tuned. Yes. Well, I think that we need to look at the, the general main commodities that people trade, yes. which is going to be oil and gold. And then, as you mentioned there, Bitcoin. I know we've discussed before and we thought we'd maybe discuss and put Bitcoin to bed. Yes. However, <laughs> the perception of what it is has changed quite dramatically in the last few weeks in that it is not a currency. But it is a commodity. And I think this is quite interesting because when it was first mentioned by the <laughs> Zinko Moss brothers or something months ago, the SEC basically sort of rejected their thoughts and comments because they inferred that they thought it was more of a commodity rather than a currency. And hence, you know, we, we moved on here. Yes, that's absolutely right. Well, I think that you have the great distinction in that a currency as such is what we call fiat. It's issued by government. Decree. First of all, let's let's look at the, at, at the standard commodity. So let's mm -hmm. bring up the chart, OK? All now, right. point here, we were talking earlier, OK? We're looking at bond yields as it goes up and up and up. Unfortunately, now it's still about 231. So that's possibly helping WTI getting close to that 60 level. Mm -hmm. But again, I think it's a question of, again, everybody in the market is trying to have a benchmark. So the simple fact is, if the benchmark stays here, will we see WTI heading towards $260 a barrel? Well, I think, first of all, looking at this chart, there has it overall been a quite a good degree of correlation. Mm. There are one or two spots here in March, for example, they jumped out of line uh, again there in July. There was some break of the link. But overall, there's been good correlation, apart from in this sort of pink circle that we have here. Yes. Uh, what I think you've got at the current time is that oil has been moving higher because we sense that the OPEC, non-OPEC parties will agree to an extension beyond March of next year yes. in terms of reducing their output. There is a sense that the market is becoming slightly more balanced, and that's helped lift the prices, whereas bond yields still are staying low because we anticipate a change in the federal funds rate yes. come December. <clears throat> We are not too moved by the change in leadership no. that's going to take place in the Fed in February. In fact, it's be steady as it goes. And so there's been no real reason for bond yields to react in any aggressive way. Uh, and they're just sort of comfortably meandering along at the moment. Uh, given that the rate changes have been so well signalled, yes. <laughs> I don't think that there's any need to react. The unemployment numbers last week were OK. Still on the wages is a little bit disappointing in America. But overall, the figures were consistent with what we've seen, i.e., Mr. Trump has been able to inflate the economy to a degree, uh, and it's steady as it goes on the bond front. Well, let's look at the next chart. Okay. Now, okay. your thoughts here. Right. This now, is probably more. This is probably easier for our viewers to understand. Yes. Now, I think that when we were speaking before, we were talking about how um, the spot price had been sandwiched between the two key moving yes. average figures there. Then it began to break up, but came back quickly to touch where the 200 and the 50 day were almost inequality. However, since that time, we've had a sense that the market's becoming more balanced. We've had this view that OPEC will continue the cut beyond March. Then there's been the shake-up within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I was going to say, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think and that's been a key uh, catalyst here. Anything that causes a sense of concern as to the stability within the world's leading oil producer is going to put some pressure behind the prices. And so that's moved up. However, what we have noticed is that that is a rather steep gain there. Yes, it is. There are a good number of informed commentators who sense that oil really is sort of beginning to run a bit thin now. It's running on fumes, this acceleration. And I think that this could well turn down. Now, I wouldn't be surprised to see that there might be a push towards the 60 level, but there'll be a big retreat from yeah, that so. before we actually make any move higher. Well, one of the things, and I think the next chart is Baker Hughes, as mm. you've seen here, what, in the last three months? Yes, I mean, it was plateauing, but it's begun to decline. And they haven't actually come back on board as much as I thought would have happened after the impact mm. of the hurricanes that went through that sort of Gulf oil-producing region of the United States. Now, one of the reasons was that we did see oil prices not really responding very well. However, given that recent movement, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you do see one or two rigs coming back on in the short term. However, I sense there'll be a more of a decline through the course of 2018. 
And what I do recognise is that OPEC are now suggesting that given where prices have currently pitched up to, it's likely just to enhance oil production in the United States. Yes. So I think that you're going to find that once again we get back to I that I think cycle. that's important because that may have sneaked out of the news earlier this yeah. week where they are expecting probably, as you say, flatlining to the end of the year, but in 2018 basically feeling even if we just stay at this level for both Brent and WTI, we should start seeing another increase. Yes, it'll be an increase to start the year, but then overall I think it will be flattish to down. Yeah. But I think what you're getting now is that some of these rigs are actually not just reopening as they once were, but existing and re-established rigs yes. are more efficient. Yes. The efficiency improves all the time, and there are new sources every day of where they can actually drill into and extract the, mm. the oil when before it just wasn't feasible. Yeah, that's, I think we've got another Baker Hughes. Yeah. Yes. So again, we've used this chart before. The, the gold line there represents no change on the week to week in percentage terms. And I think you can see that when we went through hurricane season, there was quite a big dip down mm. through that course of September. Uh, it did spike up a little bit, but overall it's still staying below. So they have tailed off the number of rigs in operation. But I wouldn't be at all surprised to see that with more efficiency, a sense that if OPEC wants to hold the line and go beyond March of 18 by cutting the production, then that just opens up a window. So in the first quarter, I think we'll see that that will pick up above that zero line once again. Well, let's look at, again, one of these things that sort of is really dollar correlated, okay? And, it, and it's gold. And it's sort of, what do you think? Well, gold here, I think we've seen that before there's been two trials at 1300, which yes. gave up. And then we moved on to 1350. Now, the good thing is that gold has stayed above its moving averages. So that's encouraging at the moment. Gold in the last couple of days has been having a little lift higher because there is a whisper going around that in D.C. the Senate might stop yes. for perhaps a period of 12 months President Trump's much vaunted tax plan. That room has undermined the dollar and the dollar index and that has played into gold's hands because as we well know that anything that's good for the dollar is not so good for gold because it makes gold more expensive in terms of other currencies and vice versa. So at the moment, this chart, albeit maybe a day or two days, yeah. uh, should actually be pushing up a little bit. And the medium term outlook going out for a month, say, is positive in terms of buying gold. And I could easily imagine that this will start pushing toward the, the 1330 territory. It's quite interesting because the World Gold Council announced yesterday, as maybe some of our viewers may or may not know, India sort of imposed some changes in the tax laws in reference to gold. And as I say, the Gold Council yesterday said that, that physical gold buying is now at an eight-month low, and it doesn't look like it's moving yet. Conversely, as we saw, okay, Indian imports of silver during the month of September were up 152%. <laughs> so are we seeing a possible change there in physical, excuse me, physical silver rather than physical gold? Yeah, I think that, see, physical gold, it's, it's one of those things you've got to pay to warehouses, yes. so it loses some of that appeal. So if you want to trade in gold, maybe it's easier just to do it with futures and be yes. in and out of various rolling contracts. Now, with physical silver, silver, first of all, silver as a jewellery, be it silver or platinum, white gold, has actually become far more popular mm, in many yes. parts of the world than yellow gold. That hasn't necessarily been the case so far in the subcontinent, but it's beginning to take yes. hold. Plus also, it is a metal which in percentage terms might lag behind gold in terms of how it moves, but it gets about you know, eight-tenths of that percent move pretty and, and much. Also, and also, if, if to get our viewers in. don't trade it, most professional traders, whether they're just traders or physical mm. players, do follow the spread. Mm. You know, it'd, it'd be like Brent versus WTI. They do follow the silver-gold spread very, very closely. Yes, that gold-silver ratio has always been a popular mm. one uh, with investors from the subcontinent because they can see a nice yes. ratio and they can get the benefits either way. Yes. Uh, it tends to have been holding around the sort of the mid-70s level of late, not doing too much more than that. But overall, I think the fact that silver gets quite a good um, amount of the play that gold will have, yes. and yet you can get exposure at such a much lower price, you know, $15 per ounce, as <laughs> against <laughs> nearly 1300 yes. or so, then it really has that little leverage effect that you could get involved in and get some good And moves. also, as we saw, iron ore has always been a big player, Australia versus China, and as we saw last yeah. night, palladium, I think, mm. for the first time since early 2000, <laughs> traded over at $1,000 an ounce. Yes, and also silver has great industrial properties yes. as well. And I think that as we are moving into this world of more sort of electric vehicles, 
then perhaps <laughs> silver <Okay>. becomes <laughs> an interesting thing in terms of what it can do in batteries, um, even though perhaps some of its role in the catalytic converters begins yep. to tail away. Well, let's see if we get the chart back up here for our good friend Bitcoin. Now, as we were talking earlier, Stephen, please continue. And I think one of the points that we decided to discuss it today was the deci recent decision by the CMA, Chicago Merc Mercantile Exchange, to say that they will start probably as early as the fourth quarter doing a futures contract. And of course, right or wrong, a gentleman I've known for years, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, uh, Mohammed Al Aryan, who used to be number two at PIMCO, basically reiterated that he looks at it only as a commodity and not a currency. And you, we were talking about that earlier. That's so. right. So the thing we have to stress is that with Bitcoin, there is 21 million coins that can be issued. And once it's done, that's it. There'll be no more. Now, given that you have that limit on what money is available, in comparison to a fiat currency, be it dollar, sterling, euro, where they can... Explain to so some of viewers who may not know the word fiat currency. Well, fiat is just a word for by government decree. Yes. So a central bank operates at the will of the government, hopefully independently in any good economy, and they can regulate how the economy is behaving by increasing or decreasing the money supply. And this can be done by physically raising more money, more zeros on the computer, <laughs> or you know, doing it uh, by directly intervening in terms of uh, draining securities out of the system or adding some, uh, and then again through quantitative easing. And so the difference is the amount of dollars or sterling circulation can just expand. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's, that's it. And I think that's very important that our viewers understand that, okay? As you just said, there has been a set limit since day one. And there's no more. Hence the reason I think we got, I want to say, a thousand cryptocurrencies. I mean, the, the names go on and on and on. Yeah. Now, we saw a very interesting move earlier this week, okay, when we had some more negative comments in reference to one central bank in Russia and other people saying, well, you know, it's, we don't like it. And UBS said something, Credit Suisse said something. And we got very close to trading below 7,000. And we all knew that you know about it, the 16th of November, there was going to be another split. Well, that's right. I think one of the first times we discussed uh -uh. Bitcoin, we were talking about the way that it, coins are released is through mining. But the algorithmic program that controls Bitcoin only allows a certain amount of uh, information to flow through its barrier or its gate in any given period of time. So they were going to have this new system called SegWit2x, which is segregated witness, and it was going to widen, almost double, that barrier, the gate, so that more could flow through. Now, at first, that thought, great, wonderful, it's going to drive the prices higher. However, the purists, the original yes. believers in what Bitcoin <coughs> was trying to represent were against this because they thought it could undermine um, one of its integral qualities, i.e. it's not to be interfered with. And so there was this great risk that whereas you'd had Bitcoin Cash split away from Bitcoin, and recently you had Bitcoin Gold was created, <laughs> so it's back to the gold standard, there was this fear that when we got to that date in November, three months after it had been first mooted, that you would suddenly see a yet another split and Bitcoin 2x would come available on the market. So it's a question of saying, if you want to have Bitcoin, well, which one would you like? And this just adds exactly. confusion. And when, as you say, we have, I think it's around 1,190 <laughs> cryptocurrencies out there, uh, but maybe that's just going to expand oh. again because you're going to have some spin-offs on these things. Uh, it starts to create some problem. And central banks around the world have at some stages toyed with actually including Bitcoin in their reserves. The Russians were thinking about it, the Chinese were thinking about it too. Then recently the Chinese decided it's something beyond our control, so we're banning all initial coin offerings on the mainland. So it gets pushed off into the outer regions of the Chinese sphere of influence. We've had people calling it a fraud. We now have people saying it's more of a commodity and the biggest source of trading commodities are now saying that they're going to list it. And that has answered a cry that's been going on for a long while. How do we short this thing? Yes, exactly right. I mean, how do, if you're a technician, <clears throat> you know, how do you look at it from a, a doji, Ichimoku right. cloud formation, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, he even came out earlier this week saying that initially the head of the CME said he did not trust it, okay? And 
most people this week have been talking about, as you said, true believers, non-believers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we, as we've seen earlier this week, we almost traded below 7,000. Then we had a little surprise yesterday afternoon. And what happened yesterday afternoon, Mr. Pope? <laughs> well, where we were all prepared to think we're going to discuss this, we'll be talking about the, yes. you know, the glorious day of Segwitz 2X, and they pulled the plug. Yes. Because there's this great fear that it would just create another split and cause ruptures within the uh, crypto market that is Bitcoin and its sort of derivatives, and it could start to undermine it. Now, it's way ahead in terms of its capital market value oh. compared to number two, which is Ethereum. But overall, they are worried that if it starts becoming diluted and overcomplicated, then people might start to lose heart and want to look at other things. Let me just interrupt you. After it hit the news last night, trading overnight traded at high of 7000 $888. Now, it's about $300 less this morning. But the question is, for some of the people that are doubters, feeling if this didn't reiterate, the investors are not really investors, are they purely speculators? Well, this is the trouble. Most of it has been pure speculation. Yes. Now, I think that we've talked before about the demographics. Who are actually pursuing yes. this? And we think it's a younger Southeast Asian basin area, people that are really chasing it. There are one or two big, powerful Western operators who have moved into the mining capacity and are treating it as a way to try and earn more yes. money. And some have done extraordinarily well. But when you start looking at the percentage moves, i.e. 11% on the fact <laughs> that Segwitz 2 is not going to yes. happen... <clears throat> But then again, you take the three months when they thought it was going to happen, suddenly it was up by 177%. <laughs> and now people will look, anything that goes up in a vertical line yes. is going to be so tempting that you've got to take some money off the table yes. and wait for it to recover before you then have another go. So it could easily be down, say, 10% or so today. And when you have a situation like that, then it is a very capricious commodity. Yes. It is not a currency, because currencies don't move in that no, manner. No, I mean, I, somehow I can't see dollar-yen moving 600% year to date, or, or even as bad as sterling may be, having a 25% drop day. But what I think is the worry is that if you want to call the establishment, i.e. governments, central banks and commercial banks, they are looking at this phenomenon <laughs> and getting very concerned, because it is making a direct challenge to what we call the fiat currencies. Yes. It is now getting recognition by having a contract yes. on the CME. But I don't think many people are going to sit back and just sort of let it roll all over them. No. The Swiss are talking about bringing in an e-Swiss franc fairly soon. Also, many major commercial banks, investment banks, commercial banks, headed, interesting enough, by UBS and Credit Suisse, are thinking of bringing in what they call a utility settlement coin. Yes, exactly right. Which is a coin that can be recognised by any bank that's behind any customer that you wish to transact business and, with. And, and, and to reiterate what you said, I, I mean, as you said, those two names are really, there are about 100 brokers, I think it's R2 or something, mm -hmm. where they want to do it to facilitate, to facilitate money transfer. And they're talking about mm -hmm. money as we know it, not in Bitcoin. So, Stephen, uh, let's just let our viewers, we will definitely keep you up with this, but as I say, Stephen and I are both watching and waiting, but thank you very much, Stephen, for being with us. Thank uh, you. Excuse me, Professor. Yes, Pope. please, please. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody have a lovely weekend, and we will see you next week. Thank you very much.